We're going to start reading today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 1, reading verse 26 through uh, verse 38, right where we, took, where we ended off last week. So that is on page 10. It's like the whole page of page 10. So these are yours to keep, and you have on the side where you can take notes and then you can always keep these together and look back in the future at what your, or in the, yeah, and see what your notes were. So, Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 26, and this is what Luke writes. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David." And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. I expect you all to underline that. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. What an awesome, awesome story here. Last week, I think I'm a little hot here. Maybe turn me down a little. I'm ringing in everybody's ears. Thank you, guys. Last week we talked about how it had been quiet for so long. It seemed like God was not doing things like he used to do. And we followed Zacharias into the temple and saw his experience with the archangel Gabriel bringing the wonderful announcement that, that God was sending the forerunner of the Messiah and that he was going to be Zacharias' son. Maybe that'll help. Maybe I had a loose connection. There we go. He was going to be Zacharias' son. Think of what it had to be like for Zacharias. We talked about that all last week. And to be the first one to see the things that were, gonna, were beginning to happen in a world where God had been silent for hundreds of years. Think of what it was like for him. God was on the move. Things were beginning to move again. And of course, he couldn't tell anyone, if you remember last week, because he had ticked off the angel Gabriel with his unbelief, and so Gabriel did what to him? Took away his voice. Took away his voice. He, couldn't, he couldn't speak, so he, he struck him dumb. God was on the move. And things were just getting into motion. And so God sent Gabriel on another mission. I told you he had the best job in the Bible. God sends Gabriel out on another mission. This time, it wasn't to the opulence of Herod's temple. We talked about how amazing that was uh, last week. No, this time it was to a, a little nothing town 90 miles north of Jerusalem called Nazareth. The way uh, Luke wrote this, it shows us, we're going to see through as we go through this thing I just read, he shows us a, a, a bunch of things that contrast. He's, he's painting a picture for us. And so first he shows us this picture he made last week in the first half of the chapter with Zacharias. And, and then he shows us what he does here with Mary. And the two contrast each other. They, they are uh, distinctly different. And the first one, what we just mentioned here, is the location is a contrast. He starts out at this glorious, opulent temple in Jerusalem up on the mountain, and this week he goes to a lowly little town called Nazareth. The locations contrasted. The city is not even mentioned in the Old Testament. It was there, it had been there for 600 years, but it was so insignificant that it's not even mentioned in the Old Testament. It wasn't noteworthy enough to deserve that. 
When we were there this summer, we could uh, see how small it was. We really didn't get to do much touring in Nazareth itself, but we did go there. And you can see the Church of the Annunciation. They built that over the spot where they believe that, that Gabriel actually came to Mary. That's one of the beautiful things about going there is that you will see the places that you read about in the Bible and you will know they are real and this is history. It's not stories or make-believe. And, and, and the city was so small at that time. Our tour guide even told us we know know that where Gabriel came to Mary was inside that building. We know it covers the right spot because the town was smaller than the church building. That's a small town. And that was Nazareth. Nazareth. Of course, you remember, too, that what Nathaniel said when Jesus started his ministry and Philip found him and he came to, uh, he, he came to Nathaniel, he said, uh, we have found him of whom Moses and the prophets talked about, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Do you remember what uh, Philip responded? Or, I mean, Nathaniel responded? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? There's nothing there. There's no, there's just, it's no good. Can anything good there come out of there? When Pontius Pilate hung the inscription above the cross uh, of Jesus that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, do you know he was actually insulting the Jews when he did that? Because your king comes from this little nothing, nowhere, no good city called Nazareth, and this is your king? And that's one of the reasons the Pharisees want him to take it down. Don't put that up there. Well, this is your king. This is it. This is what you get. Nazareth. It's not just a small town, but they weren't even the greatest people that were living there in that town. When we go through our study, we're going to come to chapter 4 in the book of Luke, where Jesus begins his preaching ministry. And, and where does he go for his first message? Nazareth, where he grew up. Wouldn't that be an honor to have this man come uh, to your town and start his ministry? And as he preached there, and as he put his message out there, the people of his own hometown tried to kill him. Wanted to throw him off a cliff. And God delivered him from them. This is Nazareth. This is where the angel Gabriel went. He, last week he's in the... Te well, it's six months by the story time, but in our time frame it was last week. And so uh, last time he's here in the temple. He's in the Holy of Holies, one of the, one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. And today he's in this little town. That was Nazareth, and we have this contrast between the temple in Jerusalem and Nazareth. And wherever Mary happened to be in this little nothing town of, uh, that was 90 miles north, that's where Gabriel met her. Verse 28 tells us, And he, that's Gabriel, came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. This was a different greeting than the standard greeting. Uh, remember, I told you last week, whenever an angel came to a person, what was usually their first two words? Fear not. Exactly. And he doesn't do that with Mary. Do you see that? He will get to that statement, but right now he just says uh, uh, greetings. What he actually says, and I love this because this passage is so full of grace. That word greetings there in the Greek is grace. Isn't that a beautiful greeting to give each other? Grace from God to you. Grace. And then he follows up, and the second word he says there is all one word too. He says, oh, favored one. That's another word that comes from grace. He's just pouring grace all over this greeting with her. I mean, you, you think about it. I mean, some of you may eat your pancakes differently, right? I mean, some of you, maybe you take your pancakes and you butter them, and then you have a little thing of, of syrup on the side, and, and you just dip your pancake in there. Well, that's not the right way to do it. You take the bottle, and you just immerse it in syrup, right? He's doing that with grace. He's just immersing this whole conversation in grace with her. Greetings, O oh favored one. The New, as the New Testament church grew, uh, many of the books of the New Testament uh, began to add grace as a greeting. As they added Gentiles, when they were all uh, Hebrews that were believing, they would greet each other with the standard greeting of the Hebrews, which is shalom, peace. And then Paul and the others began to add and grace, including the Gentiles and the Hebrews together in this faith. But peace and grace, what more could you want from God? 
And that is their greeting. Oh, favored one, the Lord is with you. Amen. Those are powerful words. The Lord, Yahweh, the creator of the universe, the God who made everything, and you're in this little town of Nazareth, and there's an angel talking to you saying, and the Lord is with you. Amen. That's why it says uh, that, that Mary uh, was afraid not because she saw an angel, but because of his greeting. What he said. See, Mary was a ponderer, if you notice that. When other people would run around and talk about everything and run around and share everything, Mary would quietly take things in and think about them. And that's what she was doing here with, with, with what this message here. You, there's grace all over you, and, and God has favored you, and Yahweh, the Lord, is with you. The one who had inhabited the temple is with you. Young lady. And that's what had concerned her. And that's why he says to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. There it is again. Just more of that grace syrup all over the pancakes. Grace upon grace upon grace. You know why that's important? We need to understand that even with Mary, what God did in that day was all by grace. Not by Mary's merits, not because she was so good. I am sure, I am sure she was a good person, right? I am sure one of the reasons God chose her, because she was, I mean, it keeps calling her a virgin, right? She was a chaste young lady. Even though she and Joseph had been betrothed, which is about an inch from marriage at this point, it would even require a divorce to break it off, there was no fooling around with them. She was true to her God. She was a person of high moral standards. And that would be important. You know, this, this whole thing about the, the, uh, the virgin birth, it was important that, that he came from a, a, a young lady that was keeping herself that way. Because if you remember, uh, later on, they would accuse Jesus of things, and, and the Pharisees were arguing with him one time, and they said, well, we were not born of so sexual immorality. What were they saying about him? Yeah, you say your mother was a virgin. And think of how that came to Mary each time. People didn't want to believe her, that an angel came to her, told her God had done this. No, it doesn't work that way, young lady. But she had the background to prove it. But still, it was all about and by grace. Then Gabriel gave her the news. What amazing news this had to be. Can you imagine being in her, in her shoes? Can you imagine being there and, and you've heard all your life of all these things that were going to happen, that the Messiah is coming. Every woman all through history had been waiting to be that one. And then Gabriel, look at verses 31 through 33, says to her, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his king, of his kingdom there will be no end. This wasn't just a miraculous birth. This was the coming of a king and a new kingdom, and he was coming through her, this young lady. She had to wonder, am I hearing this right, a king? I haven't even had a baby. And I'm nobody, and I live where? Nazareth. Nowhere. This whole story could really, at this point, uh, just be like one of the Arthurian legends you might hear from the olden days where an illegitimate evil king is sitting on the throne and he has no right to the throne. It was usurped and he was not even in line to be on the throne. I told you a lot about King Herod last year and that's exactly who he was. He wasn't even Jewish. And he held claim to being the, the king of the Jews. We talked about him last year. We mentioned him briefly last week. But you know what? This child that she was going to bear was in the royal bloodline and had more claim to the throne than the man who was sitting on it. He really did. Because Jesus would come from the house and the lineage of 
David the king. And both Mary and Joseph were from the lineage of David. And usually when you see uh, the, the lineages spelled out there, they usually only name the oldest son. And if you follow that order, as it comes down and points to Joseph, Joseph would have been one of the possible heirs to the throne of David. But he was here living poor and rough in Nazareth. And a false king was sitting on the throne. So you can see how that story could have evolved. And, and you know what the truth is? If Jesus had really taken that approach and had wanted to overthrow Herod and then resist Rome, the people would have followed him at that point. They would have gone for that. But the thing is, God wasn't looking for a human throne in the natural world. God was talking about much, much more. And that is why Gabriel specified he will reign over the house of Jacob. How long? forever not even just a hundred years not a thousand years that doesn't even scratch the surface of forever he will reign over the house of jacob and his kingdom of his kingdom there will be no end not only would this child be heir to the throne he would be heir to a throne that would last forever and ever and ever and ever and it would be handed to him by the ancient of days that's why he called himself the son of man it's all in there it's all just like Daniel had prophesied. And when Gabriel said he will be great, you have to understand that asserting that term, to, that term great to somebody without attaching it to somebody else was not done in the Hebrew world. It was the same as calling him God because that word was reserved for him. Even last week we saw where it mentioned something similar to that about John the Baptist when his announcement came. It said he will be great before the Lord. Well, they used to say that as long as before something. As long as it was attached to something. We even see that with Samuel, where they were talking about Samuel. It said, he will be great before the Lord, Samuel the prophet. But when you just said, he is great, and you leave it wide open, you are talking about God. And that's what Gabriel is saying. You are giving birth to God in the flesh. And he says, he will be called the Son of the Most High. That put him on equal footing with God. You remember when Jesus would call himself the Son of God, then the Pharisees were trying to stone him. They were going to kill him, saying, that is blasphemy because you're blaspheming because you said, I am the Son of God. And that makes you equal with God. He's not, Gabriel's not pulling any punches here. This child would be God in the flesh, as we just sang, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Like, like, first, uh, like Colossians says in chapter 1, in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything that is God was in this baby. That is impossible to understand, isn't it? This little baby, or even when he's in her womb, or even when he's just starting out, when he's like the size of a micro dot or something. And the fullness of God was in there. That's the mystery of Christ. It was clear that there was much, much more going on here than just delivering Israel from the Roman oppressors and pulling an insurrection against King uh, Herod. That is not what God was interested in. But our first contrast was right here. We go from the great temple down to this little home. And in this little home, God is coming into the world. The second point of contrast that we see in these stories is Mary's response to Gabriel. Last week we looked at, at Zechariah. We saw how well that went for him. And, and here Gabriel tells uh, her of this virgin birth and the, and the Son of God, the Messiah, coming through her. And she replies with a question, how will this be since I am a virgin? That's verse 34. If you remember what Zacharias responded, he said, how shall I know this? You see the difference? It's subtle, but it's there. How shall I know this? Mary didn't use any first-person prepositions in hers. It had nothing to do with her, did it? Zacharias, it was all about him. I need to know this. I need to be able to trust you that this is real. Okay, here's your sign. Shut up for about nine months. That's what he did. But Mary, she's only asking about the mechanics. How can this happen? She was old enough to know how things worked. 
And you're telling me it, it's not going to work that way. Well, uh, I don't understand. How can that work? Well, so Gabriel in verse 35 tells her about the mechanics. And look at the power in this statement where he answers. He says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High of Almighty God will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy and the Son of God. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, if you, if you have your regular Bible with you, too, and not just the journal. If you don't, you can look up on the screen or you can make a note. Genesis 1, verse 2 gives us a picture very similar to this from the creation of the world. And this is what Moses wrote there. He said, the earth was without form and void. This is verse 2 of the whole Bible. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And look at this next phrase. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Gabriel basically says to you, it's going to be just like creation all over again. The Spirit of God is going to be all over you. He was hovering over the waters and, brought, and, and, and God brought life to the earth. He is hovering over you and God is going to bring life out of you. The same presence that used to inhabit the Holy of Holies, as we had talked about, where men couldn't even go in without fear of death, is going to be upon you and is going to bring life into you just as at the beginning of the world. I mean, really, does it take any more for God to uh, speak life and bring life into this young woman's body than it did for him to speak life into Adam's at creation? It was no harder for God to create life in the womb of this young woman than it was to put life in the body of Adam at creation or cause the barren womb of Elizabeth to conceive with her husband and have a child the natural way. See, all life comes from him no matter what, doesn't it? Every unborn baby, every sp cell spawned by every cell in your body, probably millions of times a day, receives its life from where? God. Every single one. That's why Paul, when he was talking to the people in Athens, said this about God. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being. That is the only way we're even alive. He's putting this life in us. And God is just saying to her, Gabriel is saying to her uh, at this point, this is what God will do to you. The miracle of the virgin birth is why Jesus would be called two things. Number one, he says, holy, separated, apart from everything else. He is like no other person in the world because this is not repeated. This was a one-time thing. God stepped into our world, into our universe, through this young lady, and he's never done anything like it since. And he never will again, no matter what you hear. One time. So he is holy, he is other than, he is different. It also means you're belonging or consecrated to God. This, this body was God's that he was bringing into the world. Second thing, he says, he'll be the son of God. He was not brought uh, about by any man or doctor or anything from, like that. He came only from God, so he is called the Son of God. This is really the first time it calls Jesus that, is at his birth. And then all through the New Testament, we'll see again and again and again, Son of God, Son of God, Son of God. Yes, God the Son was always there, okay? We're not saying Jesus began here. God the Son was always there. We're really talking about him taking on this body at that point. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 2, verse 12. God the Son has always been there. Jesus did not begin in Bethlehem or in Nazareth or wherever they are at the time. God the Son was always there. Look at this. David wrote this Psalm chapter 2, or 2 Psalm, verse 12. And look at these instructions. It says, kiss the Son. And if you notice, it's a capital S. Even in the Old Testament, kiss the Son lest he be angry. Give the respect due to, the son, to God the Son. It's in the book of Psalms. And you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Isn't that a great picture of even the gospel right there in that verse in Psalms? We come to the Son, we give him his honor, we give him his place, and blessed are all those who take refuge in him, and the ones who do not will face his wrath. Gospel in one verse right there. His birth did not come about by any work or plan of man, and neither would that his salvation be brought about. Turn with me to John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13.
This is what John Run writes about Jesus coming. And he says, But to all who did not receive him, who believed in his name, he, that's Jesus, gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. His salvation is not by anything any man could do, but of God. His birth was the very same way, not by the will of any man. No one could do this, only God. And they go hand in hand. His supernatural birth foretold of the supernatural salvation he would bring to us on the cross only by the work of God it's tied closely together in that in the very next words John writes are these and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory the glory of as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth that just sounds like a Christmas card all by itself to me doesn't it Gabriel gave her this assurance then he told her about the mechanics, and then he said this, for nothing will be impossible with God. There's something you should underline. Nothing will be impossible with God. And then there in verse 36, he gives her a little encouragement to tell her how, how this can happen. How can you trust this? She didn't ask for it the way that, that uh, Zacharias did, but he gives it anyways. And he says, you know, your, your cousin Elizabeth, she's like really old. She's pregnant. She's six months along. God can do anything. Amen. And her response, we talked about that contrast. Remember how Zacharias responded, and we look at hers at verse 38. Look at this beautiful, beautiful saying, I fir this has got to be one of the reasons God chose her. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. That's beautiful. She called herself the Daulos, that is the, the bond servant who loved her master so much that when she had served her term and was set free, this is what would commonly happen in the world at that time. And if you loved your master and they were a good master and you wanted to continue serving them, you would pledge yourself to them and be their servant for life. And they would usually take you and put an earring in your ear and that showed everybody you belonged to somebody. You were not up for dibs. You could not be taken. That's what she calls herself before the Lord. It's out of love I belong to him and I will serve him. And she just says, let it be according to what you've said. When God looked through space and time and he planned uh, by his power and his grace that a young woman from Nazareth would bring his son in physical form into the world, he knew that she would, uh, would bear the spirit, uh, that she would bear the spirit and just offer herself like clay to a potter's hand, and she did. And then as quickly and quietly as Gabriel came in, Luke just records, and the angel departed and was gone. There's another response uh, she gave uh, to us there, too. If you look down one verse further than we read in verse 39, it says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judea, and it tells us that there she went to see Elizabeth, who the angel just told her about, to share her news. And the two of them could walk this path path together. God was on the move and she literally got moving and she was going to be a part of it. These two encounters, like I said, they show us all kinds of contrast uh, from what we saw uh, just last week. One uh, greeting took place and one of the announcements took place in the opulence in, in, in one of the cultural centers of the world and the other one takes place in some small hick town that many people didn't even know existed even in their day. One takes place with a distinguished old priest performing his sacred duties, and one takes place with a young woman, maybe just a teen, going about her regular duties, maybe doing something as, sec as, as sacred as washing dishes. One to, uh, but the biggest difference that we see between these two is how receptive the hearts were within the two people Gabriel dealt with. One was filled with doubt and fear, and one was filled with the most beautiful, submissive words to God that you can read anywhere. Fortunately for us, God chose to use them both. That's grace. 
question is, how will we respond to God when he speaks to us, when he taps us on the shoulder, when he says, hey, I want you to go over here and reach out to this person. Hey, I want you to pray for this person. I want you to share with this person. I want you to do this. I want you to, uh, uh, to help this person there. How will we respond? Like I said, God was gracious and used them both, but the one who was used for the greater work of God is the one that placed herself in the hands of God and said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Think of how God can use us and what he can do if we will just respond to him like that and be tender to his touch, sensitive to his words. My prayer today is that we will each have this tender, responsive heart that he can use. That is willing to lay everything aside and say, God has told me to do this, and I'm going. Just because he told me. Because that is what he really wants to do, is to use us that way.